Hi and welcome to the Adelaide Horror Podcast. It's your host, Zombie Joe. Today's episode 17. February is the month of women in horror and I'm going to be paying homage to Jackie Kong and her 1987 cult classic horror film, The Blood Diner's relationship with Blood Diner as a kid. Uh, I was... I was between seven and eight when this movie came out um, and so the local video shop was uh, promoting it at the time on the VHS and so they of course had these big cut off you know posters and like I've said in previous episodes before I would wish I had those cardboard cutouts now like that they had uh, it would be amazing and, and a fortune too uh, the Blood Diner it started off as a major poster cardboard cutout promotional thing as you walked in the door like uh, of the video shop and so I came face to face with this uh, with this the poster uh, which is now what we know the front cover art for Blood Diner which has had the the 50s style uh, neon sign with the blood coming down on the on the knife uh, the deserted looking forest with the full moon and in the background up the top is the the smiling demented chef uh, that uh, that illustration that just got seared into my brain uh, as um, as I stared at it and just was was terrified but intrigued at the same time and then when the quote says first they greet you then they eat you and I was like what is this movie like <laughs> and I'm like I don't want to know but I want to know like uh, so it really kind of scrambled and men melted this little seven-year-old turning eight-year-old's head uh, and I was just like I've, I've got to know about this movie so um, you know growing up I, 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 I really kind of forgot about Blood Diner for many years uh, you, you get distracted with other horror films you know you're, ch you're trying to chase up all these other cult movies that you know about you know your exorcists and all that kind of stuff and you're, you're busy kind of uh, catching up you know with all these uh, classic horror films that were kind of out before your time and now that you're old enough to watch them it's like this big game of catch up to watch them all uh, so unfortunately Blood Diner kept getting missed uh, as I was as I was going, or I remind myself and go, shit, you know, Blood Diner. I remember that. Like, I'm going to check out Blood Diner, and then it just kind of kept getting missed, you know, because another movie would distract me, and it just went on and went on like this for years, uh, until finally I came across it at my other local video shop at the time, Alpha Video, which was used to be off McGill Road. Uh, it was a like a, where, a warehouse, um, uh, and just giant place with these amazing movie titles and uh and they had a really good horror section and uh blood diner was was in that uh was in that collection and so that's when i watched it and looking back at that time i i, I know it sounds weird but i wasn't ready for it like uh, what it what it was like and i kind of watched it halfway through it and I mean this is this is pre this is pre-internet this is pre-mobile phone so back then if the internet and the mobile phone was out I would have been looking through my mobile phone midway through this movie I would have just disconnected from it because I wasn't interested at it at that time uh, if that makes sense you know like I'd I'd, I'd watch trauma movies and that and understand that that's what it was that's the kind of movie that it was and i enjoyed them and i knew that's what they were but i had to be in the mood for trauma you know and i wasn't obviously this day in the mood for for a trauma like movie like blood diner so i just kind of went yeah and put something else on and uh the reason for that it's got nothing to do with Jackie Kong. It's got nothing to do with the actors or the people that made this film. It was purely the fact now, and I've seen this listening to other shows, um, you know, pop culture shows and all this kind of stuff. I fell into the victim. I fell as a victim into the um, mega Star Wars fan 
making the movie before they went to see the movie and the movie in their head was better than what premiered at the cinema and they go home all pissed off because it wasn't the Star Wars movie they wanted and in a way that's what happened with me I built this Blood Diner movie in my head since I was seven what this Blood Diner movie is you know because in my seven year old brain this Blood Diner movie was exactly like Hotel Horror like which I watched later on but like to, because the illustrations are the same um, and I thought it was a remote diner out in the middle of nowhere where this chef on the on the front cover freaking manging on people like that went to eat there like so I'm thinking you know this is what this movie is and then I put it on and it's LA and it's these two guys and they're, they're making making veggie burgers and uh, you know you know if it, I was just like, what is this like? And then it kind of hung in there for a bit. And then I was like, nah, this is too off the rails. So, like I said, that was just me personally at the time. I was just not in the mood for it. Like, um, and didn't really get where it was coming at. So then once I got a few more horror movies under my belt and then proceeded to go through the whole catalogue of trauma movies, then I started to kind of go, oh, okay, hang on a minute this is what Blood Diner is supposed to be. Like, maybe if I look at it from a different point of view and I'm now watching it again, ready knowing what it is, I'll enjoy it a bit better. So, um, and then years went past. I didn't eventually end up getting to do that, like, up until recently because uh, I got to... Um, last year, I missed the uh, female uh, the women in horror uh, months uh, because I was filming I started filming the and writing for the, the Adelaide Horror Podcast at that point and I already did a movie review and I kind of missed the boat on, on uploading a movie for uh, uh, women in horror so I said okay I'm going to do it next year so next year came along and I was like, right, I want to do an episode um, celebrating Women in Horror for the Women in Horror Month. So I kind of sat down and uh, thought about what I wanted to do this episode and who I was going to focus my attention on. And in, in doing so, uh, at the same time, uh, I got a package from overseas and it was the In Search of Darkness 2 um, movie pack that came out with the posters and all that and I'll show you that later uh, and so I sat down and started watching you know uh, this uh, the, the doco and uh, Jackie Kong popped up and I went that's it you know this is this is this is perfect you know this is who I wanted to talk about because I always thought about it but I kind of went hang on is that like so I went cool so um, I uh, sent a message to Jackie and uh, on the Instagram and Facebook kind of posts and that kind of stuff and kind of try to to, to, to see if she was interested in, in doing a, uh, an interview in researching for the show I found a lot of other stuff and a lot of other people that had interviewed uh, Jackie Kong and one of the best ones that I came up with, and I'll give you the link for it, it's an Austrian gentleman called Christian Genzel, and he runs a podcast called Moving Pictures. And um, Moving Pictures um, did an interview with Jackie Kong, and it goes for about 70 minutes, and it's really good because he, he sets the interview up and then just lets go, and then Jackie does all the talking. There's no... You don't have the interview jumping in and butting in and interrupting. He's a really good uh, uh, host and uh, interviewer, uh, and I really enjoyed the show. And uh, so listening to that, and as good as that was, I was able to really get a kind of a feel for and an understanding of who Jackie Kong is, the person, the director. And uh, so, I'll, like I said, I'll attach the link to, to that uh, podcast for you to listen to. Uh, and uh, so you can listen to more of his shows as well. So well done, Christian. It was really good. I was a big fan of that. And so 
uh, I was able to get, like I said, an insight of who Jackie Kong was, and I said, yeah, I, I chose correctly. Like, you know, this is, the, she's very an interesting, you know, um, choice uh, for this for this month, and I, I really wanted to, hopefully had the, the chance of, of interviewing her, because listening to a lot of other interviews and stuff like that, there was a couple of questions that I made that other people hadn't asked, and I wanted to, to kind of dive in a bit deeper about Blood Diner um, a bit more rather than asking the same group of questions. So hopefully that happens. If not, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's really here or there for me. But um, I just thought, you know, uh, Jackie needs the, the, um, the uh, praise that, that she deserves for this. And, um, yeah. The main reason why I picked Jackie Kong for this episode is because we're celebrating women in horror and Jackie Kong with her movie that was 30 years above its you know ahead of its time uh, kind of thing with Blood Diner um, the reason why I picked her was because you're looking at a woman that had to essentially bust three glass ceilings like in Hollywood in order to do her film to have a film career and that's Adam sexism and racism like she's a young Asian woman uh, coming forward with a horror film and the execs and guys that are in production companies and other directors and, and are all white male like and instantly would get their back up at that idea or you know so um she talked about the struggle you know of doing that and just being a bit of a hardhead like and having thick skin and saying right i'm going for this and that's the other reason why i really admire jackie and why i wanted to interview her but also another reason why i, I wanted to talk her about her on this episode is she had that real go get him attitude and uh, what I mean by that is um, she, in order to get um, uh, people on the show, she just went out and got them. Like, didn't, didn't go, oh, I should or I shouldn't, or, you know, mm, I don't know, maybe I should or shouldn't. And so she, she goes, right, okay, I've got this movie. This I'm referring to The Bing now. Uh, and I want Martin Landau in it. So she goes to Martin Landau's acting school and with her script, and he thought she was there for the acting class, and she goes, no, I'm not here for your acting class. I've, I've got a script. I want you to be in my movie, and kind of left it at that. And, and Martin, you know, obviously pretty, you know, wow, okay, uh, read the script and later signed on for it because he liked the script. So that kind of... You know, I want somebody. This is what I'm doing, and I'm going to go out and get it. That attitude impressed me when I when I heard about that in the uh, in the um, about her. And so the other thing that was kind of impressing me as well was just other little things when you hear you know uh, interviews or you heard her talking about stuff or when you're reading stuff on IMDb or you're you know researching through other other um, sites and she like another mentor that she had was uh, Robert Downey Sr. and so Robert Downey Jr.'s dad um, and he um, sat and encouraged her during editing of movies and, and things like that and I'm kind of paraphrasing but you know she's, she said like I've, I learned off, a lot off him but how he directed her, I found impressive as well. At the time, good on him as well. Because there was a scene and he said, it's the right scene, but the wrong movie, All right? So I thought that was a really good thing to say because you're not really knocking her to the curb, saying that's a shit idea. You're just kind of going, okay, maybe put it somewhere else. So, and that way it's getting her to think about what she's doing, but not belittling her uh, or saying, you know, nice try or whatever and that kind of stuff. So given the theme of, you know, uh, women in horror and how misogynistic a lot of these thing people were and the struggles that women had uh, in uh, making these movies, 
you get good examples of someone like Robert Downey Sr. Uh, kind of uplifting and mentoring somebody without an agenda, like without some kind of creepy motive, like, you know, I'm going to help you with this if you help me later on. That kind of stuff, like he legitimately took her under a wing, mentored her, and wanted her to be a better person and a better actor or a better director or whatever with without anything in return kind of thing, just wanting her to succeed, which is great. Um, so that was really good to, to hear and see that as well. So, and then just when she was talking about her style of like making movies and things like that, you know, uh, filming Blood Diner in 18 days, uh, being really smart with how she shot this film. So she got all the actors and the stand-ins as well, and they rehearsed their their role and, and their lines and all that months before the shooting. So then on the day of shooting, they just rocked up and did it, and that was it. Um, or what she would do was keep the, the film rolling. She would stand near the cinema photographer, cinematographer nice and close so she saw the actor really close the, the and the picture in the in the camera kind of thing and the, what she was seeing, whether she liked it or not, and then was able to say, okay, change this lens or whatever. Um, and in doing so, just said, okay, now try it again and do it this way and just kept the film rolling. So then later in editing, she could chop and change and put in what she wanted and that's how she did it without, you know, um, so that style was interesting. And she also said that the, one of the main things that she likes about uh, the movie making process is uh, the editing process of, uh, that's her favorite thing to do, where she puts the, 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 um, the story together uh, that way. So um, I thought that was, that was interesting to, uh, to hear as well. So that was cool. So yeah, just just listening to you know this this podcast and and just reading countless uh, articles and stuff on on her talking about this movie, I really got a vibe that you know I really would have liked to work with her on something um, or, or work for her. Like she just she's got this natural kind of uh, leadership quality uh, that you'd like, uh, and uh, is very artistic and visionary and. Um, I just I liked the premise of Blood Diner and what it was about, and I really wanted to uh, kind of pick her brain where she got this the the plot from the story, the shit talk, like you know, all this kind of like, stuff, you know, all this and, kind of stuff, uh, you know, and things like that. And that's that's why um, I picked Jackie for this uh, for this thing. So if you're not familiar with Jackie Kong, uh, and I've kind of you know tickled your fancy on on who Jackie Kong is. Uh, like I said, I've, I've, I've attached the link to the uh, uh, the uh, Christians um, Moving Pictures podcast uh, episode to, to listen to on that one. Uh, also in hunting around. Now, as a kid, because I was kind of, you know, scared slash obsessed with this Blood Diner show um, and my parents and I would go to town on a Friday night to do uh, late night shopping, uh, there was a comic book in between the arcades and I used to go in there and they had Fangoria's. So, you know, I'd buy a comic and then go through and read other books and comics in there. And I always used to gravitate towards a Fangoria uh, at some stage. And I distinctly remember opening this Fangoria and it was about Blood Diner was one of the articles now and i googled it and I, I found the issue that i was that i was talking about and even looking googling it and looking it up i was like wow major nostalgia and i thought i remember this uh it had pumpkin head on it i was like what the fuck is that like and uh not, you know being a kid not really knowing what the pumpkin head was what, what that was about later on getting to watch the pumpkin head movies and loving them for what they are like you know initially being a kid didn't really know who pumpkin head was uh and so opening it up i was i was able to flick through the pictures and look at you know the the and the images of blood diner um that that came up and and again scared me but intrigued me more of what this movie is about like you know and then i saw shatar for the first time and i was like what the fuck like i was i was like whoa like 
uh, it's really like more scared than intrigued like I was like yikes like that's never had nightmares or she never freaked me out it became nightmare fuel afterwards but I just you know I was just kind of whoa what the hell is that like you know so then you fast forward to now and I'm thinking to myself how did Jackie create the Shatar like where did this come from you know and I kind of wanted to pick her brain about what inspired her to make the Shatar and and uh you know um and that kind of stuff is amazing so uh yeah it was it's an interesting thing because when you look at the movie and she's talking about you know you got these two guys this their you know their uncle is a serial killer they've grown up to be inspired by him and so in turn become serial killers themselves and um she said she deliberately picked two good looking guys to be the serial killer like and and so they not not so much george but michael michael's the front man for this he's the all business he's making the you know the ceremony arrangements he's you know he's real business about this like he he wants this ceremony to happen he wants to get his hands on a virgin so he could do this sacrifice he's on the hunt for who that is he finds it pretty much straight away uh you know he listens to what his uncle says he's reading the book he's you know he's really as whether george is a just a loose unit like he's he's just a nutbag like and he's he's uh he just goes yeah I've got, i'll kill i'll kill and he just goes off and does it kind of thing and and doesn't really care uh as he just enjoys doing it because he's just really that loose is whether michael is more uh like i said all business and picks and finds who he wants and all this kind of stuff and so <clears throat> and michael is this good looking guy and so a lot of the girls you know find it easier to talk to him and like it when they talk to him and him when he talks to them you know he's got the charisma and and that kind of stuff and so jackie didn't want to create a serial killing group of people that are just terrifying and you could spot them a mile off and if you saw them you'd cross the street so um you know we know many movies that the killer is just ugly and and full-on and and scary and you just wouldn't go near them at all um one you know so and then you got this charismatic guys and everyone was saying why are you making them charismatic why are you making them good looking and they were kind of arguing with jackie like why this was her choice and i thought this was really odd because um i'm trying to think whether ted bundy was already caught at that point of time because the the common thing that you got from the people who survived ted bundy was that he was a charismatic good-looking guy that everyone kind of got really caught up in uh and that's why all these you know he had these groupies in prison like he um you know uh deborah harry uh talks about getting into the car with ted bundy in new york because even though she initially said no to his request of having a lift because the weather was bad and then going oh, okay what what the hell why not because he was good looking you know uh, if he looked scary there was no way he was getting in the van uh getting into his volkswagen like that that everyone kind to have known now is ted bundy's volkswagen but deborah harry like you know went okay so and this was pre pre blondie like so Deborah Harry could have been a, a victim of Ted Bundy, like, uh, but she got in a smart on pretty quick and managed to get out. But I just that story came to mind when everyone was arguing with Jackie. Why did you pick this good-looking, charismatic guy as a serial killer? Because that's just a crazy idea to do. And well, unfortunately, that's the reality of how most of these guys are uh, good-looking, charismatic, and able to get. You know, there's some exceptions that are but ugly, and they're just disgusting and ugly inside and out but there's some charismatic serial killers that assisted them in order to be able to do these murders in the first place um 
So I thought that was funny that there was a bit of pushback. Jackie got a lot of pushback from a lot of people uh, because she had her vision. And, and I think it's a lot to do with the fact that she was a young Asian woman, like, and, and it was, and that sucked. And that's how it was back in the day. But, you know, here we are. Uh, 2021 uh, celebrating and uh, encouraging women in horror and and uh, you know the it's starting to shift uh, the society and, and view of what a norm is is starting to shift and and that's great you know we've we've come a long way we've still got a long way to go but you know we're making the headway and we're making the inroads so that's great um, you know I've I'd like my uh, my daughter to grow up, you know, watching horror films, and I'd say, hey, look at what Jackie Kong's done. Like, you know, like if she goes, oh, I want to be a director, I want to do movies, I want dad, you know, that I'd say check out Jackie Kong, you know, perfect perfect role model, um, really, for that. Um, so yeah, cool. So anyway, I'm gonna start talking about Blood Diner the movie, um, and then <clears throat> yeah. So like I said, initially in the first initial views of this, you know, and and thinking that it was one movie and it turned out to be the other, and a kind of a, a few I call misfires of of views, you know, um, and that's why I was kind of slow to the to the kind of table when it came to uh, Blood Diner, uh, and then. Then it kind of the time was right, kind of thing is is the way I describe it, um, and yeah. So let's start talking about uh, Blood Diner. This isn't. I'm not going to do any spoilers or anything like that. If you want to watch Blood Diner, yeah, YouTube at the moment it's it's on change. The 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 quality isn't that great, um, and. Yeah, I mean, you can sit and watch. If you don't care, if you just want to watch it and you don't care, like how the, the how visually how it looks and stuff like that, check it out on for free on YouTube. But you can you can buy it. Uh, you can buy the Blu-ray on eBay um, and stuff like that. I'll be I'll be getting into that later on. Uh, and uh, there's VHSs if you want to start collecting VHSs. Um, not really region four DVDs. They're all like region zero or region two or three. They're imports from Germany or uh, US or Europe. So uh, you're not going to get a region four DVD of um, uh, Blood Diner unless someone's specifically selling it. Uh, you'd have to get a non-regional or a non-region or an all regions DVD player and then be able to buy one from say the United States and it's an uncut box edition or something like that is really how you're going to do it. Uh, if you're not really keen on committing like that and you just want to see this movie for what it is uh, Yeah, really no harm check it out on YouTube um, and, and then kind of go from there whether you like okay I know I like what this movie's kind of showing me and yeah, I want to commit to buying it then You can go on eBay and have at it pretty much uh, If you haven't seen it and you want to watch it you know because you understand what a trauma movie is and you know that it's a splatter kind of gore film black comedy uh you know riding on the edge of tabooism then yeah you're gonna like it if not no nah, don't do it you, you you're gonna rage quit within 30 seconds of this film uh just uh you know um yeah on uh on some stuff so just yeah that's that's my kind of advice uh, given that aside, I can kind of start talking about the movie. But like I said, I'm not going to spoil it or anything like that. I, I, yeah, if you're intrigued, you can you know, watch it that way. Cool. So uh, Blood Dino is uh, opens up with the two boys playing in their front lounge room. It's a suburban LA street. The mum's kind of in the picture for a bit, walks around, then walks off. And it was really kind of distant and cold with him. You know, where are you, little shits kind of thing. And just kind of, oh, there you are. I'm going to the shop, blah, blah, blah. Walks out. You know, no cuddle, kiss, love for mummy, love you guys, you know, that you see in other movies or that you do with your own kids yourself, like, you know, uh, when you leave and uh, and then you hear like this, uh, you know, 50s radio pronouncer, you know, there's a there's a killer loose and all that and it turns out to be uh, Uncle um, Amar, the, the boy's uncle, and um, the two boys are playing in the front room and, uh, and they... <coughs> They're 
So young Michael has got a fifties Felix the Cat clock, you know, the the eye with the eyelids that that go like that, and uh, he's he's watching it, kind of you know doing this eye thing, and he's kind of practicing hypnotism, like. And George, on the other hand, is making plasticine dishes, and they've got a toy dog Pomeranian on the on the on the uh, on the couch. And so, <clears throat> after you hear this news thing about, you know, this psycho killer, whatever, the camera's kind of panning it, and as it's doing so at the start, there's, you know, Crazy, the theme song is, is uh, playing, so there's another 50s kind of uh, connected song to, to the scenario. And Jackie does it in this scene, she also does it in the closing scene. Uh, there's another song called let's make love and it kind of matches the the scenario of this thing and then it's closed credit so i thought that was clever that opening credit there was a theme and closing credit there's another theme and the music and the song relates to what that is which is great so you're panning across the table you see a time life magazine and it's uh it's set the thing so that's 1961 so you get an idea of what year it is uh there's a bit of a time stamp there give you a clue of what's going on uh, and anyway, so the boys are playing and there's racket on the front door banging and all that. And they, they're scared initially and they run behind their toy trunk and, um, you know, Hatchet goes through the door, starts carving up the front door and, and the guy comes charging in and, Uncle Emma, like, you know, so the kids know who he is. So you kind of go, oh, shit, like, you know, thank God, like, where was this going to go? Um, that kind of thing. And uh, he's... Is all love and joy for his nephews. He loves his nephews. And he goes, you know, you've been reading my books. And so you kind of see across, you know, ancient um, civilization book. And it's obviously about the Shatar and, and all that kind of stuff. Oh, it's one of our favorite stories, you know. And uh, then he gives him the two pendants that belongs to the um, to this ancient culture that, uh, that um, worship Shamar. Uh, Shatar and um, so the boys are practicing so you kind of what I was going with this right and then he runs out the front the uncle runs out the front because the cops are at the front they said you've got your surrounded blah 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 so he decides suicide by cop that's how he's doing it so that's what happens there prior to this though and I, I looked at it and I went okay what's going on here Little one is either Michael is telling George to bring the Pomeranian over because they're going to practice the ritual and they're pretending that they're sacrificing the dog to Shatar, like, or they're literally going to do it. Like, I, I couldn't, I couldn't quite work that bit out, like, and and because it happens so fast but you kind of get the premise of what's going on and I was thinking okay shit are they are they going to kill the dog because that would that would tick the serial killer 101 box you know killing animals for practice kind of thing and and the dog is you know the the real big the big animal up there to to kill if you're a serial killer um so I was like, okay, where they're going with this one? And then, you know, Crazy Uncle rocks up, does his thing, goes out the front, death, by, you know, suicide by cop kind of situation, and that's where it kind of ends. Um, and I was kind of like, okay, they didn't kill the dog. Uh, but I was like, shit, is that what these boys were doing? Because um, George has made the meal, and he's there practicing, you know, Michael's practicing hypnotism, and then tells his brother, okay, bring the dog over. So I'm thinking, are they are they going to do it? Or are they going to just practice, pretend, you know, that they'll do I wasn't quite sure with with that. So interesting factoid too, the um, little little Michael is played by Roxanne Syllabelle, also um, um, Roxanne Os Osco uh, turns out to be Jackie Kong's daughter. Um, I I didn't I didn't know that. Um, and just with reading the IMDb and doing research for the show, so I thought, cool, that's a bit of a, a cool factoid. 
uh, Roxanne kind of she pops up in all Jackie Kong movies, and then in 1998 uh, popped up as a, as a, one of her roles as a makeup artist uh, in the movie Urban Legend in 98. So I thought, well, okay, I'm gonna check out Urban Legends again and see if I can find her. They did a good job because I I watched this movie and not once did I say to myself, hang on, that's a girl. Like they slicked her hair back, you know, they gave it a thing. I thought it was a boy, like, and, and I was like, wow, okay. So uh, we'll play Jackie. But yeah, that was pretty cool. A uh, little interesting factoid there. So then you skip ahead and the boys are uh, you're in their 20s now. They're in a cafe, you know, the, the Totem Cafe, uh, Tootman Cafe, uh, and um, real life location. It's now the Greco New York Pizzeria uh, on Hollywood Boulevard and the... Kilhangan Boulevard. Uh, I had it written down. Uh, the uh, I, do, I do actually. I'll spell it for you. It's uh, C A H U E N G A Boulevard uh, in Hollywood. It's now Pizzeria. Uh, so that would be pretty cool to go and check out the actual location there. Um, and so when they were shooting this this movie, it was a full functioning diner. Like yeah, they made it look like on the outside. So Jackie was saying, you know what you see in the background in the scene at the start with the boys uh, in this diner and you've got the cheerleaders in the in the booth and all these other people are eating and in the background you can see the cars are parked and there's trucks going past and and people on Hollywood Boulevard walking around that's actually happening like it's not like extras that's real life just happening outside while they were filming inside and the extras and the stand-ins were inside the building and they were just filming real life outside like uh, and people outside looking in were interacting and jackie was like they thought it was a real diner like uh how they how they made it um so it'd be interested if there was any extras or stand-ins that came in and joined in the movie uh by walking in accidentally thinking it's a diner they're like oh sorry we're shooting a movie hey, you want to join in, be in the movie? Like, you know, that would be pretty cool. Uh, so the front of the diner is it as it is, and then Jackie explains that whenever uh, George or Michael go into the back room bit, when they, they go into the back room of the diner, uh, that's actually filmed in another location. It's actually filmed in the same location as the nightclub scenes uh, at uh, during the movie, and then the final kind of showdown scene is uh, shot in the club and that sub room off that is where they filmed the back of the diner in in that so it's kind of you know as jackie explains a movie magic where they walk into through this door to the back and that's where they stop because and then they go and shoot the next diner scene and the next diner scene and then when they go to shoot the nightclub scenes they do all the other back room diner scenes in this other location that's how she shot it so, <clears throat> and I realise I jump again forward a bit. So when the boys, before the we see them in the diner, they go to the graveyard. They exhume the body of of uh, of Uncle uh, Anwar, and they get him up and they take his brain and they put it in a jar. And that's how he comes to to encouraged him to continue this the ceremony of the mission that he was supposed to do uh but he failed because he was too sexually charged uh to do it and um and so he trusted the boys and kind of one like i said one uh interview i heard you know suggesting that they were brainwashed by him and it's true they were um into into doing his bidding kind of thing and continuing on um, his uh, serial killer kind of mission in uh, raising Shatar. Um, so put his brain in a jar, and uh, the, and he says, you know, okay, let, let me stand near this mirror, and it's this one-sided window that looks into the diner, and he's able to pick who the um, who the people he wants uh, that are perfect for uh, for creating. So there's two sub groups of victims that he wants one he wants a collection of body parts of women 
to make up the one body that is then going to be given to Shatar to use as a vessel. Two, the second group of people are just to be cut up and chucked in this big vat this big bowl, like a minestrone of body parts, goes into this thing, and that's what Shatar's going to eat when she is resurrected, to give her the strength to then be the almighty, powerful goddess that she is. So it depends on who you think. So the group of cheerleaders at the front of the diner, and this is where we meet Connie, uh, and Connie is turns out to be the uh, a policeman's daughter who's the same policeman that shot the uncle back in 61 uh, and she is you know softly spoken is a part of the cheerleading team but not outgoing and uh, you know loud and, and robust as the other uh, teenage girls are in her cheerleading squad by today's standards those cheerleaders weren't that controversial <laughs> or, or immoral, as the uncle would put it. Um, and uh, so he's picked them and said, those are immoral girls. They're the ones that I want you to, to kind of kill and cut up. And and so that's what the boys do. Like, And there's another scene, and that's where that happens. And, uh, and they, you know, they're doing nude aerobics. Uh, they're getting filmed doing a new aerobics kind of video, you know, they're getting paid to do it, you know, this kind of stuff They've invited Connie. Connie said no way. That's not my thing She kind of gets put down by the group and you know, and is left at the diner uh, and that's where um, Michael being charismatic kind of you know talks with her and comforts her and says you're beautiful and all this kind of stuff and really kind of butters her up for the next for the next um, show and invites her to come back again to eat and uh, so he's kind of locked on her as the as the kind of the virgin that he needs to um, to sacrifice to Shatar for the ceremony so that's his agenda there and that's kind of what I was talking about before uh, Jackie kind of highlights you know guys helping women because they have an agenda um, uh, behind their motive to being helpful and that's what he's doing is being super helpful to Connie and comforting because he wants he wants her kind of thing so then the scent schemes you see the naked aerobics kind of happen and you know um, these guys go in political masks on machine gun the place kill all the cheerleaders uh, and then you know you hear the distinct uncle voice uh, and sure enough, it's the boys, and they've they've pulled their masks up, and uh, you know they're cutting up, you know, the body with cordless, you know, cutters and and stuff like that. And so they're the body parts to make to get sewn together to make shatar, the the body vessel for the shatar. And um, so for me, re reviewing it. Because I'm not American, I don't get the whole, you know, this was a political statement at Reagan thing. Um, I'm not a, going to attempt to understand it or pretend that I do understand it, but it was a political statement at the time, um, and I'll just leave it at that. So um, Michael is wearing a Ronald Reagan mask when he machine guns all the, the girls and and stuff. So, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I won't dive into something that I don't understand so uh, but I do know that's a, it was a political statement so <clears throat> the that happens then we get introduced to the cops because then the cops go to investigate it and you just kind of you know yeah it's they investigate the murder of the uh, of the security guy at the graveyard that got killed trying to prevent the boys from exhuming the body of their uncle and then they're now on the the case of this you know person that's just shot up you know this film studio with all these naked cheerleaders and and, and it's just left body parts behind and um and so we kind of get introduced to these uh to these cops um <clears throat> and then we get introduced to uh sheba jackson who's the uh female cop that gets um assigned to the, the detective and 
she's an interesting character because and I and this is the other question I wanted to pitch to Jackie what was she kind of the the symbolism of of the misogyny that she would have got because this woman is a minority like she's a young African American detective trying to tell these guys you know this is what's happening here we need to go and investigate it over here and they're going nah you're a woman you don't know what you're talking about pretty much through this thing like and it's just it's black gnats and and I thought okay this is this is kind of I don't know if it was done on purpose or it was you know yeah this is you know another kind of hint hint like this is what it's like for us kind of thing or it's Jackie reflecting this is what it's like and the cops are representing Hollywood and producers and she's coming in as a minority trying to pitch something and everyone's just knocking her back because either her age her race or um, her sex being a female you know or all three you know so that's kind of the vibe I was getting off these detectives when they were treating this character like she because she was the only one really with the brain trying to put trying to piece things together and doing the hard yards and the the other detective was this pretty boy dumbass like he was he's like you know yeah um so that's kind of how I felt about the cops and why they were always you know the 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 these brothers were as a step ahead of these guys um and you could tell the frustration and the annoyance of um of Shira Jackson because she's she's getting close and and her partner's cock blocking her essentially every time because you know they you can't stand the fact that you know she's got a better idea than him or is doing well or you know so um anyway in between the end ceremony scene and in between is the kills so you've got this kind of montage of of different scenes where you know uh michael's killing someone that he's picked up at the nightclub george is killing someone that he's picked up at the nightclub um and then you know he goes out to do some more murders and you've got this comic relief scene where he runs over a particularly large biker and uh and it just doesn't stop there it just seems to keep going and um it's it's quite funny because um this scene if it was redone again as i was saying would be funnier if you had jim carrey doing it because when i was watching it i started to i kind of started to laugh because i was just like oh my god this guy's mannerisms he's like holding the he's holding the steering wheel he's got this crazy 50s music he's running this guy over and he's like like this and he's all he like he's he's delighted that he's doing it like you know and he kind of runs over and he looks in the review to see him and the dude stands up and you're just like what <laughs> so he runs over him again and he's like ooh, 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 like because he's shaking around he's over you know um the physical comedy is like really over the top in this scene and he does it again and he looks up and the guy stands up and you're like what the fuck's going on <laughs> so this one goes on for a couple of minutes and you know it's quite funny like it's it's it is it is quite funny the dark humor and the physical comedy because it's no, no one's talking uh in this scene it's all physical even the guy getting injured it's physically funny like you know what he's doing and uh and then you know eventually he, he gets killed and then you know kind of george moves on uh, takes his body and then you know goes on to this next site and the next site is this couple that that were in the diner before uh and they're um kind of uh you know making out and about to have sex on the in what looks like a cave kind of thing like at the beginning of a cave and uh anyway so and then mike uh, george turns up with his axe and you know so this big strong muscular guy that was pinning this girl down to have sex has just fallen to pieces you know, he like is, is trying to beat him up and not successful because George is a wrestler. Like, and so this scene kind of caught me by surprise. And then I thought, I know what Jackie's doing here. And I liked it. I thought it was good. So basically, every 70s and 80s slasher movie 
coming into this blood diner. The girl's naked. She's about to have sex. She's already had sex or whatever. So now she has to die by the rule book of this of this um, horror stuff. So in order to do this, she goes. Um, she's initially terrified. Like she's like you know upset, emotional. She's trying to fight him off. She's you know pushing back and whatever. And then literally the flip of a coin, right? She just turns around and just kung fu's the shit out of him. And and it's just like he tries to hit her and she blocks it. Like, and it's just this kung fu bit, and she's just serving him back his ass. And then, like, you know, grabs like grabs his member and just twists it. And I'm thinking, mate, you don't get up from that. Like, and and you know, I was I was kind of like, I know what's going on here. Like, you know, she's chucking in a bit of a, you know, nut. The girls are fighting back kind of thing uh, on this, and I'm not going to be a stereotypical kind of uh, the nude female victim, why? Right? Because she's had sex. And so she fights back. And the guy that, you know, um, uh, that was, you know, all big and boisterous before, nowhere to be seen, is a bubbling mess, like I said. And then, you know, so George gets attacked. Uh, and then, you know, the girl manages to escape briefly and then dies for another reason, like, altogether. Like, but not at the hands of the killer after she's had sex. So that, I think it was, uh, uh, and this is my view, but this was kind of, I think, what, um, you know, Jackie was trying to throw the the institution on its head, like of how society was was seeing it, and like the girls were fighting back, kind of thing for a moment. If if anything, for a moment they were fighting back rather than just being, you know, straight out victims. And there's some other females in this movie that are just straight up victims. They don't even get to fight back at all. Like they just get picked off. So it's. Um, yeah, I kind of picked up what Jackie was doing there, and I hope I interpreted that correct. But like, I just that's what I liked about it, and I thought it was cool. So, um, so that occurs. They get, you know, she gets uh, found for some reason. Doesn't get cut up because the, the the police are taking her away, and the boyfriend's just you know beside himself, and and he's saying like, if I wasn't so you know, if I wasn't a horny idiot, you know, she'd be alive now, and it's kind of like this remorse. Like, and you don't see that in any other film. Like, and when I heard that, I was like, wow, that was, that was a bit like, you know, jeez. So again, I think Jack is kind of leaving her print, you know, um, her little kind of stab, her jab at the, at the kind of, uh, the, at the society. So I thought, well done to that too. Uh, and then the brothers, you know, uh, the movie kind of goes on. Uh, and it kind of gets to the uh, the bit where Michael hypnotizes Connie uh, uh, at this point uh, to come to the ritual, like because she's going, no, I'm not coming because I've just found out my, my friends are dead and she's all upset. And he gives her the amulet that the uncle gives them as a kid, um, and so he's able to mind control her uh, that way, um, and. Um, so I thought, okay, he's he's done it. He's managed to perfect the hypnotism, and he's he's got it. So she's going, yeah, I'm going to come along. So she does. Uh, before the ceremony, um, Michael uh, George has got his uh, wrestling uh, gig. So he's he's got this he's wrestling little Hitler like this character, um, and he's just getting thrown around all over the place. Like it's not looking great. Uh, and then um, kind of something snaps inside uh, inside uh, George and he bites a chunk out of this guy's leg and so of course you know the wrestling match is cold off and you know um, he's kind of you know in his element at that point and the the piece of the leg gets spat out I don't know if, if uh, it was done on purpose but he spits it at Connie and gets her in the face with this with this piece of leg like from this guy and so instantly she just freezes and loses her shit and is like I'm going home and I've had it and I'm not doing this anymore and the guy's going look you know tonight's the feast I've made this feast for you tonight's the ceremony I want you to be a part of it 
Michael's really kind of going, no, you really need to be there. I really want you there. She's going, no, 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 just take me home. She's too upset. The whole thing's just freaked her out. And so, and then Michael shows his true colors. He goes, oh, well, you know, yeah, and decks her and just knocks her out. Like, um, and a passing guy just looks at her and he goes, yeah, just can't handle wrestling. Like, you know, just, just cash. Like, uh, and the guy just walks off. Like, as everything's fine. Like, you know, so it's just, yeah, you know, it's pretty, it's like, what? Like, you know, now, now no, nah, forget it. That won't happen. Like, there's no way that would happen. Uh, you know, someone would just walk off like that after seeing something like that. There's no way they'd get reported or, you know, challenge the guy or something. But, you know, and like I said, that's really what Jackie's trying to um, portray you know, in this um, in this shot. So we get to the nitty gritty, the actual ceremony, the resurrection of Shatar, the, the 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 group, the band, the you know the band, the rock band, very very cramps, you know, kind of style punk band. They're playing, you know, um, and. Um, uh, Shatar is there she gets resurrected and uh, so that part of the ceremony went well uh, Connie wakes up realizes that she's the virgin sacrifice she's freaking out she's screaming the place down um, the cops have managed to track down where the boys are and managed to get there um, so they're trying to get into the crowd uh, you know this kind of stuff and um, you know they finally get in there's a big showdown kind of thing um, and I'm kind of paraphrasing because I don't want to spoil the film. Like, if you if you want to check it out, you check it out. I haven't done major plot twists or anything like that, so you're not gonna you're gonna get the plot twists that you you need to see, um, and um, and the things you need to see. So this is kind of big showdown kind of thing uh, amongst the cops, amongst Shatar herself. Now the interesting kind of nod. Uh, to this is um, and I wanted to, to kind of run it past Jackie he was the design of Shatar is the the stomach opening and that to me reminded me of Videodrome uh, and where John Woods puts the, the VHS tape inside of him um, the and this one here the stomach opens like a Venus flytrap like it's got the same fangs that everything this whole stomach just opens up and uh you know so um either connie's head has to go in there or someone you know it's yeah some someone has to go in there and it's going to get fed to the shatar kind of thing that way and that will make her ultimately strong um so that's what she needs and in the meantime what's happening is that everyone that's at this club like Michael and George have gone around and given them mushrooms and all this kind of stuff and that makes them trip out and and uh, turns them into a zombie and then they kind of go green and they and they start eating the big bowl of uh, blood the minestrone of body parts kind of in this big bowl so they all start hacking into it and then there's a cut scene you see the and this the crowd's getting bigger and bigger with all the zombies are getting bigger and bigger and people are starting to turn more and more and then they start eating each other and like, like you know it's it's on for young and old kind of thing and it's real chaotic too because you're trying to you're trying to see what's going on you're trying to follow the characters and yet and it's just a lot going on in one scene you know um and yeah and it's really interesting to uh thing and and jackie said that she just she just took over the editing process and edited the last 10 minutes of this movie herself because uh, it was just chaotic and the person trying to edit it was having a hard time what to put in, what to leave out, that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, there you go. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so it's... So the the guys, uh, the, the cops managed to get in, you know, and, and of course it's, you know, uh, uh, Shira Jacob, uh, Jackson just pretty much taken over and and uh arresting you know you know um going in to arrest these guys and taking them on and they're attacking her and she's fighting back and you know kind of and that that uh, ensue uh that happens and you know so and then the movie ends 
uh, it, it ends with a certain particular scene, and that's the end of that. Like, and then you get the credits. Like, so that's really the Blood Diner. So, I give it seven out of ten. I like the um, the story plot, the the kind of where they were going with it. I liked it. Um, the film quality wasn't great but that's just because it was uploaded on YouTube that's got nothing to do with the thing if I saw the the remake cut version on blu-ray it'd be good I'd be able to appreciate that that quality a bit more but I understood what the film premise was uh, I was kind of looking at it in a more deeper critical eye this time and so I kind of got what Jackie was trying to put out there for this and uh, and, and like I said that's the reason why I picked her for a uh, female uh, women in horror uh, for the women in horror month uh, episode um, so yeah definitely go in and check it out I started to watch the being halfway through the other thing that's impressive about the being as well is that she actually created the monster Jackie came up with the with the concept of this creature attacking a town and and stuff and that was an environmental um, kind of uh, social commentary uh, at the time as well so that was another kind of um, statement by Jackie in her movie, which I thought was cool. So I'll continue watching watching that one. Um, yeah, so uh, for me, like I said, I'll give Blood Diner 7 out of 10. Um, I enjoyed it for what it is. Uh, it's a basically a trauma-esque, gory, exploitation splatter movie. Um, if you don't like that style of film, don't watch it. Um, it's not the movie for you. You're not going to like it. And like I said, within 30 seconds, you're going to rage quit in the middle of this film. If you go in there with your mind blank, big ass bucket of popcorn, you want to turn off, you want to see some some crazy shit, some gory stuff. Uh, the taboo stuff doesn't really mind. You, you know, you're, you're a fan of trauma, kind of. You can watch a trauma movie if you're not. It doesn't bother you whatsoever. You're gonna you're gonna really enjoy Blood Diner. So, uh, so I'd highly recommend that. Um, yeah, cool. So with the uh, and I was kind of thinking I missed talking about it before. The the illustration was done by um, Stephen Blinken Stephen Blinken's stuff, I'm, and, and it sounds like Blinken stuff. And I'm trying not to say the Blinken Blinken stuff. Uh, and he's the main uh, illustrator for the guy on the the, de the demented chef kind of uh, illustration on top of the poster. And then digging around, I was like, because I wanted to know who he was because I just really loved that illustration, and I just wanted to know who this guy was that or girl who did it. Uh, and uh, yeah, found out who it was. Illustrator for the cramps. Now, if you and I went, that's it. There's an album in 1984 called Bad Music for Bad People. Now, if you look, if you Google, I'll put it up. Um, sure enough, there it is. Now, if you flip it the other direction and you give it a chef hat and make it pale rather than yellow and you get him picking his teeth with a, with a, with a knife, there's your chef like it's it's spot on like and i was like well there you go that's pretty cool so there's a, another cool little factoid there um apart from that so that that was uh that was good so yeah i hope you enjoyed uh the review for um blood diner uh it's it's an interesting movie and and i kind of like I said, it's funny how the relationship I had with it and I've built this movie up to what it is and, and it turned out to be something completely different and I don't mind that it was something completely different. And funny how I watched it one time and it didn't impress me, but watching it the second time with a different mental point of view, like in a different perspective, and I enjoyed it. So it's just a matter of being in that headspace or that right time or understanding what it is so i hope that my explanation has helped you understand what this movie is and that you can go out and go okay i'm better prepared to watch blood diner and accept it for what it is and uh to enjoy what it is so yeah so well done jackie on that one 
uh, again, like I said, I'll, I'll add some notes in the in the uh, YouTube bit here, so you can look up um, the uh, uh, the podcast with Christian and listen to the um, Moving Pictures uh, podcast. Uh, I'll put up the picture from Fangoria and uh, all the other bits and pieces and stuff uh, for that as well. And uh, yeah, so currently at the moment, while she was talking about. I was listening to the show and I sent an invite out and this would have been roughly the same time she said into the interview. Now, I don't know and I doubt it, but I think she was saying I'm not accepting interview requests at the moment. She was telling the guy because she's in the middle of writing a show, a series on based on an urban legend that she invented. And so she's been very busy with that and that's why she only accepted this guy's interview thing and then took it and so she said to the other people I know that you've sent me invites but I'm not doing interviews at this time because I'm too busy um, doing so I'll do this interview and that's it and then explain why I haven't responded back to other interviews so I don't know whether mine fits that timeline but if if not it doesn't matter it's here or there really um, she's making a, a good and I'm looking forward to it man like if uh, to see what she can come up with with this new uh, urban legend um, TV show. So I look forward to it. She said she's going to try and pitch it this year. Um, given the current situation in the US, I, I hope it does turn out to be the case, but we'll, we'll see how we go. So I don't know, watch this space. Next couple of years, we'll be looking at another Jackie Chan, uh, geez, Louise, another Jackie Kong movie tv show we'll, we'll have a look so cool uh until then uh i hope you enjoyed the show um like and subscribe uh on the youtube and uh facebook uh, i've now recently added to itunes so you can uh, listen to the uh, podcasts on itunes Stitcher, and spotify uh let your mates know about it uh do a bit of a plug that way um, we've got new members that have joined in. Uh, one currently, uh, Astrid, has got her um, fringe show, uh, and I've added that to the um, uh, for the to the uh, Facebook group. So, if you have a read, like I said, message Astrid or check it out. It's in the um, it's in the guide, uh, the fringe guide, um, and there's some other fringe uh, shows that I'm pretty keen on checking out as well. So. Uh, maybe do a live uh, show from there. So here we go. So uh, yeah, cool. So thank you very much. I uh, hope you are uh, all doing good uh, and that you enjoyed the show and uh, cool. So I'll see you next time and stay scary.